messing up the internet. Okay, I'm going to go ahead and share my screen and get started on the presentation. Um, All righty. So as you probably read in the advertisement for tonight's talk, I'm going to talk to you about the social lives of rattlesnakes. And what I think is like extra exciting, at least for me, to give this talk to this particular group for the Highlands Center is that um, the research, so the kind of the meat of this talk um, is about a research project that we conducted just outside of Prescott. So. If you're a local, this is with some of your local neighborhood rattlesnakes. Um, but I'll introduce myself first. So my name is Melissa Amarillo and I am now the executive director of Advocates for Snake Preservation. And that's a picture that my partner Jeff took of me doing what's, this is actually, again, was taken at our site um, just outside of Prescott and kind of in my more comfortable position of being on the other side of the camera. <laughs> um, and Advocates for Snake Preservation is an organization that Jeff and I founded in 2014. And we are all about education. And in particular, we're trying to change how people view and treat snakes. Um, this um, picture of Jeff and I a long time ago with no gray hair, um, we're looking at a den of Western diamondback rattlesnakes. And this particular occasion was maybe one of the first seeds um, that got us to thinking about the need for an organization like this. And this was our first rattlesnake den that we had ever studied. And I'm gonna talk a little bit more later about like what I mean by den, um, but just bear with me for this. And we were really excited to try to figure out how to monitor this place and these snakes without disturbing them, which was not the kind of science that we were used to doing. Um, but before we had a chance to get started, um, some people happened upon this place. Um, it was near some, some pretty public areas, but nothing too busy. And they killed every rattlesnake in the den. And, you know, I, this was obviously upsetting to us because we were just starting to get to know them and think of them as friends that we could learn some more about. But I think that, you know, it also just shows the people who did that were probably not like bloodthirsty monsters or anything. A lot of times when people come across snakes, even when they're in a wild place, like not in their backyard, they think they're doing a public service by killing that animal because they're perceived as dangerous and a threat to everyone. Um, you know, so I think they probably thought they were doing a good thing and making the world a safer place by killing all of these snakes. And that sort of attitude has, you know, been fed in many of us like throughout our whole life by every newspaper article that talks about snakes attacking someone or every documentary that tends to focus on snakes as predators and dangerous and who's the deadliest and et cetera. Um, you know, to even just like movies and stuff like kind of recently Harry Potter where snakes signify um, evil wizards. They just, they get a bad rap all around. And so it totally makes sense that people would be scared of them and would dislike them and think that they're out to get us. And so basically Jeff and I formed this organization because we realized that conservation is almost impossible to do with an animal that is, is so disliked and feared. Um, and somebody needed to show a different side of snakes, a more positive view of snakes. And so that's what we formed ASP to do. And this talk is actually an example of a different side of snakes, I think probably than you've seen um, that I'm gonna show you tonight. Um, so I think many people are probably like, social what? <laughs> when they saw the title, because we just don't think about any reptiles, well, except for maybe the feathered reptiles, birds as being very social. And this was true when Jeff and I started our study of social behavior of rattlesnakes um, in 2011, is that we got a lot of pushback, especially from people who know and like snakes very well. They just didn't really think of them as social in the way that we were looking. And I think the way that we typically think about social behavior when we think about, you know, 
animals of any species hanging out in a group for a reason other than sort of the, the typical well-known thing, like snakes reproduce sexually. So they will come together when they're mating. And then in the case of male rattlesnakes, they also fight over females. So those are, those are you know, social behaviors that involves more than one animals. And those were things that we, we did know about in snakes. So this is a pair of Western diamondback rattlesnakes. Um, one of these snakes is Henry. And this is a video of a pair of Western diamondback rattlesnakes in combat on a pile of manure. And um, this wasn't the same pair as in that photo, but one of them is the same snake. And basically this is, so this is what rattlesnake fights look like. Um, it's pretty common for a video like this to start floating around on social media as a mating dance of rattlesnakes, because I think again, because of those ideas that many people have in their head about rattlesnakes being mean and aggressive, we would expect a fight to be all bloody and violent. And they're not, I mean, they, they do look like they're dancing. <laughs> Um, and basically what they're doing, it's kind of like thumb wrestling. They're just trying to push the other one to the ground. It's really rare for any biting to happen during one of these combats um, or even for rattling when it's taking place with rattlesnakes. Um, and they will only do this if there's a female nearby. So these same two snakes we saw sitting on this same manure pile the morning this video was taken. Um, but apparently a female had moved in. She's likely hiding in the brush. We were never able to locate her. And, you know, that got those male hormones going. And um, so then they start fighting to show who's the toughest. So this is another example of a rattlesnake fight, just in a little different habitat with a different species of snake. Um, this, again, if you're local old Prescott. This is another one of your neighbors. Uh, well, not these two individuals specifically, but these are Western black-tailed rattlesnakes. And they're also found in that area. And this was Marty and Jaden fighting over a snake that we called Persephone. And we were actually able to locate her. She's just kind of on sort of like in front of the, the camera on the other side of that, that tree and stuff. Um, and after this fight was taken, we were actually able to see the, the victor of this fight, um, Jaden, uh, hanging out and courting Persephone for a while, like a couple weeks after um, he stayed with her for a couple weeks after this, this fight ha happened. So that's what a rattlesnake fight looks like. And I said that, you know, that's was often mistaken for courtship. Courtship is the rare behavior. Um, you don't see it as much because you know, like I mentioned with the Western Diamondbacks, we were never even able to find that female because they tend to stay in cover. I mean, most snakes tend to stay in cover unless they absolutely need to come out. Um, so often because the males are the ones that are approaching the females, um, the, you won't see the courtship because they're often some hidden place. So we got really lucky, well, lucky in a lot of hard work. There's a whole long story behind this video that's like another hour long talk, but these are rock rattlesnakes. So they're found in the Sky Islands in Southern Arizona and also Southern New Mexico, Western Texas and like all throughout Mexico or Northern Mexico. Um, this was in my backyard here in Silver City and the coiled up snake, that's Carol. Um, she's kind of a little more pinkish in color, which is an interesting thing about the species is that Sometimes the males tend to be a little greener and the females tend to be a little pinker, which is pretty rare for a snake to have sexual dimorphism when the, um, when the pairs look different. Well, I should say it's rare for them to have sexual dichromatism, which is where they're two different colors. Um, but that is often the case with rock rattlesnakes. So compared to a rattlesnake fight, um, there's a lot less going on here. Mainly the action is taking place by the male. Um, in this situation, Carol's kind of flipping her tail around, like, I don't know, like, I mean, I'm definitely doing a lot of interpretation, but she seems very like inviting, like, hey, I'm interested in you, compared to what we've seen with some other courting rattlesnakes where the female was clearly not interested in the male because she actually hit him in the face with her tail, which Carol doesn't do. 
Um, Daryl, on the other hand, is doing a lot of sniffing around. He's just now at this point in the video starting this chin rubbing behavior, which probably serves to um, give off some pheromones to Carol to make sure in case it's not clear that he's really interested in her. And also with doing all that tongue flicking as he was rubbing his head around near her face and body, he's looking to, or smelling to see if Carol's giving off pheromones, letting him know that she's interested and receptive for mating right now. And this all seems This behavior is called stacking. And what we think is going on here is that he's he's mate guarding. So he's he's trying to hide her, um, maybe protect her from any threats. In this case, I guess the, the camera and the fact that somebody's standing there filming this whole thing. <laughs> um, we followed this pair around for a week in our yard, but they were still pretty, pretty wary of us, I'm sure, since rattlesnakes view us as threats. So, so those were some social behaviors that were fairly well known, although we're still learning some, some details about those in snakes, but that, that wasn't what our study near Prescott was actually about. So we were interested in um, den sites and social behavior at an Arizona black rattlesnake den or a couple, a couple dens that we found near town. And so what I mean by den in this case, because it's used a lot of different ways is this is a place where the snakes will spend the winter. Um, and it's not uncommon for there to be multiple snakes that share a den site, especially as you get to colder and colder places where there are fewer spots that will stay warm enough, um, but not too warm and not too much temperature fluctuation. So kind of limited habitat that provides a good site. And when you're further south, um, you know, it's a little bit easier to find to find a spot so maybe you can get your own but when you get north you get a lot of animals sharing these den sites and like there are some garter there's this famous set of garter snake dens in Canada that has tens of thousands of garter snakes using the site which is amazing and definitely on my bucket list of things to see and in addition to just having um, a bunch of a single species you'll also have multiple species sometimes sharing these overwintering sites because they're such good spots. So just in case you didn't catch it yet in this picture with the very obvious Western diamondback sitting out at the entrance, um, there's also a Gila monster and at least a couple more Western diamondback rattlesnakes sitting inside. And in Southern Arizona, it's really common for Western diamondback rattlesnakes and Gila monsters to share dens. And we've also seen a lot of other animals turn up at Western diamondback dens as well including desert tortoises um, and desert tortoises and heel monsters especially will often share because they really like burrows. Um, and so those two share dens even more than they do with rattlesnakes, but occasionally you'll get all three at the same place. Um, this is another Gila monster outside of what's primarily a Western diamondback den, although also at this particular den, um, there's a Sonoran whip snake that we caught on one of our cameras an Arizona black rattlesnake at that den. And this is, I believe a Western patch nose snake. One of the, one of the patch nose snakes, I think it was Westerns that we had at that site. They look a lot alike, especially with not super great quality time-lapse cameras. <laughs> um, but that again was not what we were interested in. What we were interested in again was this um, set of Arizona black rattlesnake dens. And although it certainly gets cold in that area, both of the years where we studied this particular site, um, we got snowed out of collecting data and all the snakes went back into their dens, like I think in May, both, both years, this kind of seems to be the normal pattern up there, at least it was. Um, but there are lots of rock outcrops, lots of places where it seemed like the snakes could den. And yet they were choosing to den together. And unlike what you see with um, that gar those garter snakes that I mentioned before, and at a lot of Western diamondback dens, in the spring, when the Arizona blacks start to emerge from their den, you do not see any reproductive behavior at all. There's no fighting. 
There's no courting. They're just kind of hanging out. And that's been another reason besides habitat limitation that scientists assume that the snakes would share a site is that in the spring, you can kind of get a jump start on not having to locate a receptive female later in the year if you're already sharing a den with her. Um, you can get to her, you know, have your fights with other males that are there um, before you take off and you can just spend your summer feeding. And that does happen at a lot of other snake dens, but that is not something we saw at this Arizona black rattlesnake den, even though the animals would start to emerge. Um, generally the second week of April, it's highly dependent on what the weather is doing. And some of those snakes, a lot of them would still be around um, a month later, later in mid May. Um, so that's a long time to just be hanging out. <laughs> um, so we were really interested in, in what was going on there. And if there was something more complicated, then they just didn't have another place to go. Um, so specifically, we had a couple questions. And the first was, are the individual snakes selective about whom they associate with? And by associate with, um, we stuck to pretty simple definition of being social and being together because this was the first study of its kind in any kind of snake. Um, so by associate with, we just mean that they are close enough to each other where they can um, detect each other so they can, they can smell the other snake. They could identify them as you know a specific individual, which is something that laboratory tests have shown that rattlesnakes can do. Um, and so that's within about a body length of each other. They should be able to smell each other at that point. Um, and, the, and that's what we mean by an association. And our other question was, though, beyond just being selective in general about who they're associating with, do they have preferred companions? So what we would call in human animals, friends, um, and other animals that they just absolutely avoid. So again, this is a typical basking scene. Well, actually, this one's a pretty dramatic basking scene. That's why I picked this picture. Um, Arizona black rattlesnakes, like their name implies, can be large, nearly jet black rattlesnakes, um, but they change color as they age. They actually start off being kind of um, gray with brown blotches, and then they generally get darker as they get older, but um, some of them never never get that dark. So there's a ton of variation in color and also some in their pattern, which was really helpful for us with the study. So they're, they're what's considered a, a medium-sized pit viper, so one and a half to three feet. Um, this is not a giant western diamondback or black-tailed rattlesnake, but it's it's a pretty pretty big animal capable of eating small mammals, and they also eat a lot of reptiles. Um, they live in Arizona, and they just barely get into New Mexico. And they're a mid to high elevation species. So where we studied them, it was about a mile in elevation. They can get quite a bit higher than that, and they'll go pretty low in elevation too, as long as they have de decent tree cover. That seems to be very important to them. And so when you get down towards that 900 meters or 2,900 feet, that's generally you're finding them in riparian areas with a lot of a lot of trees. They seem to to like that, and you know, like I said, at this site we were studying this behavior around um, uh, them overwintering in groups, and they will also gestate and give birth in groups as well sometimes. So it's a sum because even at the same spot, we'll sometimes find individuals that. Had a, had a den all to themselves and so spent the winter by themselves. And same thing with the gestation and nesting behavior. Um, we saw, because we also did similar sort of study on their nesting behaviors with these cameras, um, where you would get a group, of, a group of animals nesting together and then like 50 yards away, there would be one female by herself. And all of those animals share the same overwintering dens, but for whatever reason, when they're nesting, they have different preferences about nesting together versus separate. And uh, at this series of dens, we had, we were able to identify 107 individual rattlesnakes. Um, 
fairly even split between adult females and adult males um, and 61 juveniles. And so I have them split this way because we didn't catch most of these snakes. Um, so the only way we could tell if they're male or a female is in adults because that's when they start showing those secondary sexual characteristics that we can see without having to pick them up and poke them and prod them with things. The males are relatively bigger. They have relatively larger heads and longer tails. Um, and because we looked at so many at this one place so long, it was actually a lot easier to tell. Um, but with the juveniles, until they get old enough, which at this particular spot seemed to be around five or six years old, is when they would start showing um, differences, physical differences, if they were males or females. Um, so those we just classified as juveniles. So I said that we didn't catch most of these animals, but we identified individuals. And usually for identifying snakes in science, the way that I had been taught and in the way most of most scientists do this, is you inject them with microchips, kind of like the ones you can get for your dog or cat, um, or you'll cut little individual patterns in their scales on their belly. Well, the problem with those methods are you, you have to catch the animal and then you have to catch them every time to be able to either scan them with a microchip reader um, or look for those scale counts. So we wanted to do something where we didn't have to touch the animals. We wanted to observe their behavior as undisturbed as possible because they do react to humans. One of the reasons when you see rattlesnakes on TV and they're almost always rattling is because that's a fear response. It's a defensive behavior. And that's how they usually react to us. Um, so we had this plan to use cameras and we needed to have a way of identifying individuals that the cameras could do. So following another pioneer in this area of learning a lot about snakes without having to handle them, um, we identified individual animals by their patterns. And this is also how people do it when they're studying um, like whales and other animals that you just like you can't catch um, is just looking for either scars and scars weren't really something most of our animals had, but they did have these weird blotches. And so these three photos on the screen, this is all of a snake named Zona um, that we met for the first time in May, 2010. And she was about eight months old at this point. She had been born the previous summer. Um, and then we saw her again, like a year later. And then again, you know, sometime after that. And even though she, because she was so young the first time we saw her, she grew tremendously between these pictures her pattern relatively stayed the same. So the different colored circles on each picture are, picture are circling the same weird blotch. And so I'll just focus on the one in the red circle because it's the easiest one to see. So we always would try to find three or more weird looking blotches to make sure that we didn't have du duplicate <laughs> animals. Um, and Zona is a really easy one. So that first blotch, which I think is number nine, um, as a Florida. And so we would make a note of what the weird blotch looked like. And actually we had like drawings for each of the snakes and also what number it was. So we could pretty easily count in the photograph or as we were looking at somebody with binoculars. And so this is a fun story, but if we had never captured any of these snakes, like, you know, I would have no way of knowing if maybe there were just a bunch of snakes that had this exact same pattern. Um, but with Zona, and a few other snakes that we encountered once they had left the immediate den area. So we were less worried about disturbing their behavior at that point. Um, we did capture them and we would give them a permanent marker that you had to see when they were in the hand, but also we would paint their rattle and we would give them a unique combination of colors. So that was for the ones we captured a nice backup method if we happen to see that um, on our cameras but also it was nice for us to show that this method does actually work and their patterns do not change through time. They just get bigger and sometimes get harder to see as the animals get darker. Um, so this is kind of a typical setup. So we would focus on these areas around the dens where we knew the animals would bask in groups. And we set up these time-lapse cameras to to do the behavioral observations for us. 
So we didn't use um, trail cameras, the ones that people often use like to track mammals because those are triggered either by motion or more often by differences in temperature. And especially in the spring, the snakes are pretty much the same temperature as their background. That's not always the case, but it usually is this time of year. So there's just not a big enough difference for them to set off a motion triggered camera. And, and if the cameras are looking for actual motion, the snakes move so slow in the spring. Like you don't even realize, it's like watching glaciers recede. <laughs> like you don't even realize they're moving. Um, so again, they don't trigger those cameras. So these time-lapse cameras work really well. We set them to take uh, photos either 30, every 30 seconds or every minute. Um, it meant that we were sifting through thousands and thousands of photos of nothing at time, but we didn't miss a lot of the behavior because again, the snakes were moving really slow. And, you know, convenient for us, our cameras didn't work at night. They didn't have flash, but also because it's still pretty chilly at this time of year at this place. Again, this is April through mid-May, and we generally had at least one snowstorm. So the snakes weren't out at night anyway. Um, so we would just have them take, take photos all day long. And we used a total of 14 cameras. So, and I don't remember how many photos we ended up with, but it was, um, I don't know, it was like a couple of terabytes. <laughs> so we would take those photos from the time-lapse cameras and to make them easier for us to view instead of flipping, flipping, flipping through a slideshow, um, we would make time-lapse videos. And that's what this is. This is a, an, another Arizona black rattlesnake den. Um, so that's why this video is a little jumpy. It's not necessarily your internet connection this time, um, but these are photos taken, I think every 30 seconds with this one. Um, but even with that, you can see hopefully that they're still moving pretty smoothly. Um, they just work really well for studying snakes in the spring because everything they're doing is so slow. So time-lapse um, doesn't miss much, at least with rattlesnakes. So all that's well and good. We now have thousands and thousands of photos and then a lot of videos that we stitched from those photos together. Um, but we need, we're scientists, so we need to turn that into data. Um, so what we did was we determined that each day was a sampling period and we would take all the photos from a single site and, and have like a day's worth of photos. And for each, each time there were snakes on the screen, we needed to identify who they were and if they were alone or if they were associated with another snake. And, it, and the way that we had the cameras set up, generally if they were on the screen together, um, that was an association because they met that threshold of being within a body length of each other. And so should have had the tools available to make a choice if they were going to make a choice about whether they wanted to hang out with that snake or not. Um, so the next step was to take all of those days and whether or not snakes were associated and with whom and put numbers to it so we could do statistics. Um, so we calculated an association index and basically an association index is telling you how often these animals are together. It's an estimate of the amount, the amount of their time they spend together. And for us, because we were just looking at this behavior for that four to six week period when they emerge in the spring over two years, we're not saying that this is like their association throughout their life, just for these specific periods um, hanging around outside of their den. Um, and so this kind of complicated cartoon equation is, is just trying to account for the bias of sometimes there were probably animals off of our cameras that we couldn't see, but they're still you know together, but they just happen to be off screen because our camera setup wasn't perfect. Um, and also we were occasionally not able to identify snakes. Um, they just, we wouldn't be able to, to get a good glimpse of them. Some of the cameras were not as good quality as others. Um, and so this particular equation places more importance on when you definitely identify two snakes sitting next to each other than when you see them by themselves. 
And so what we're getting at with these association indices is that for each possible pair of snakes um, in these snake communities at these dens, um, they get an association index that again, is just an estimate of how much time they spend together. So for example, a pair of snakes I'm gonna talk about a little bit later um, had an association index of 0.5, which just means they spent, we estimate that they spend half their time together. And so we calculated those for all 107 <laughs> rattlesnakes times whatever. I'm not gonna do that math of how many pairs that is, or I should say those 107 are spread out over two different sites that are separated by about 400 yards. Um, and there's actually a road and trail running in between those two sites. Um, so one of the sites only had about 20, 20 or 30 snakes and then the rest of them. So we didn't do the pair calculation for animals from those two different sites because um, during that part of the study and actually in the almost decade now since that study, we've never seen an animal use both sites. So those seem to be, at least during the spring, distinct communities. Um, so for each site, we end up with the little matrix that's down in the lower right-hand corner. And just, it shows for, you know, where each pair of animals meet, like that's their association index, that estimate of how much time they're spending together. And so that's why there's like a row of one, or a, Diagonal of wands is because they're always with themselves, but the rest are um, something less than one because none of the animals, or sorry, almost none of the animals were together all of the time <laughs> with one other snake. Um, yeah, and that's a small part of it. It's a really big table or matrix of animals. So, oh, and then we use this specialized program that's just made to analyze or it calculates and analyzes association indices to look at social behavior and social dynamics of animal groups. And it's called social frog. So um, we also map out, and this is um, using the association indices, but it's not really a statistical thing. Um, these graphics of social networks and when I started doing this work, this term was a lot less known than I think it is today. I think now when we hear social networks, that is a phrase that's pretty familiar to people, but we sort of think of like, oh, like Facebook or Instagram or whatever. And, and that is not really that far off from this situation. So these graphs um, give us a lot of information if you know how to read them, because they're, they're complicated. There's a lot going on here, but it's just showing how every individual in these communities are connected or not. Um, so MC and ATR are the two different communities. Um, there's no lines going in between them because like I said, we've, we've never observed any connections between animals. Um, each circle is an individual animal that we identified. If they're gray, that means they're one of those juveniles that are too young for us to be able to tell if they're males and females. The males are blue and the females are orange. So you've probably noticed that these circles, the individuals are different sizes. And that doesn't refer to how big they are because there's some very large juveniles and some very small females and males. Um, what that means, it's kind of like how social or like how extroverted they are. For every connection they have, their circle gets bigger. Um, so you may also notice that on some of the really big circles, there are a lot of lines going to them. And those lines are represent a connection or an association between that and you know, the two dots that it's connecting. So you probably noticed that some of the lines are a lot thicker than others. And so that just means that they were seen together multiple times. So those are those high association indices, those animals that were together 30% of the time or 50% of the time. And then um, less noticeable are, is the line of tiny little dots like off to the side. There are no lines connecting those animals. Um, those are actual individuals. And the reason the dots are tiny and there are no, no lines is, are those animals were never observed with anybody else. They were only observed by themselves. And there's actually 
quite a few and there, and you can already kind of tell of the variation in this population among individuals, because for instance, those tiny dots, they're not all males, they're not all females, they're not all juveniles, although there are a lot of juveniles um, that were not seen with other animals, um, but, but it's a bit of a mix. And same thing with the, you know, the presence of dark lines, that's not necessarily always a female or always a juvenile or always a male. And the males aren't necessarily less social than the females, just again, by, by looking at these graphs, which at first look like some sort of confusing spider web, um, but they actually tell you a lot already about the social behavior of these snakes and how they are doing something. Um, you know, before we even get into the, the statistical stuff. So now we're gonna get into the statistical stuff and going back to those questions that I had at the beginning. So this was looking at whether they are choosing their associates or who they're hanging out with um, and avoiding others. And so there's separate graphs for the two different communities, MC and ATR. And along the x-axis are the types of pairs. So the first one for each graph is all. And so that means just all the pairs in the community. And then they're break, broken down by female juvenile, female and female pairs, female male, male male, male juvenile, and juvenile juvenile. Um, each one of those types has an orange bar and a gray bar. And so what those are is the, the orange bar are our actual observations, like that's what we saw. And what's on the y-axis, which we're actually looking at here, is the variation in their associations. So remember when I was talking about the graph and I said, you know, some of the females have, you know, there's like thick lines here and thin lines here. And so this is looking at statistically if there actually is a lot of variation or not. Um, but what does a lot of variation mean? Um, so in order to determine what a lot of variation is and if they are more variable than, well, you know, enough to be called uh, social and be making choices about their associates, um, we use that program to look at what a random snake would do. Or in the case of this analysis, what a random female juvenile pair did. And so that program takes your actual observations and it shuffles them around. So it uses the same number of animals that you have and that are present at the study site on any given day. So that it's it's not, you know, saying like if, if they all stayed the whole time because you constantly have snakes kind of coming and going. Um, so it uses your real data, but but mixes it up and does that a bunch of times until you know you call it random and it takes the average of that. And so that's what the gray bars are. And so whenever you see for those, those pairs, so for instance, um, the juvenile juvenile ones for the MC community, I think are kind of the easiest to see because it's the tallest bar. That orange bar is a lot taller than the gray one. And that means that there's a lot more variation in what the real snakes are doing compared to what the random snakes were doing. So they're not just randomly associating, they are actually making choices about who they want to be with and who they don't wanna be with. And that's what we see with the higher variation in their association in disease. And this isn't true for all of them. Some of you have probably already noticed that there's some groups on the ATR graph that are not much different or not at all different. And like I said, that's, that community was a lot smaller and it could be that the animals were doing different things, um, but it could also be that there just weren't that many of them. So there was a lot less data. And so it's just harder for us to find a difference there. But at this point, like we can't say that about, about all of the individual pairs, but it was true for for most combinations of snakes and when you looked at all of them in general for both sites. And so 
our other question kind of digging in, so that's looking at, um, you know, the general patterns for all of the snakes and for female females and female males. Um, but we were also interested in some of these animals that had really high association indices. What does that mean? So people, other people that I have really high association indices, those are who I call my friends, who you hang out with a lot. Um, and so we kind of wonder, and this is something that people have looked at in a lot of other types of animals too, are there some special bonds? Are there some association indices that are high enough to where we would call them, and this is not what we will call them in the science paper, but I'm calling them this now because I think it's a word that actually makes more sense. Do they have, do they have little rattlesnake friends? And so the two snakes pictured here were not, chosen at random or just because the one in front, Mole Man, is just gorgeous, although he is. Um, Mole Man and Priscilla are a male and female snake. And this is an example of a pair of friends. And so what we did to figure out if they have friends, again, following what researchers have done when they're looking at other snakes, is we looked at actual association indices between real pairs of snakes. And then again, did that shuffling and mixing up to see what that would look like um, for a random snake, just kind of hanging out with anyone. And then we took the average of what the random pair of snakes would be and what their association indice was. And because we had a lot of pairs of snakes that were never paired. There were a lot of zeros. We didn't include those when we calculated the average because if we had, honestly, almost all the snakes <laughs> would be friends. And that seemed, we wanted to be a little more conservative than that because again, this project is, you know, people are really skeptical about it because we just didn't think, well, other people didn't think that snakes were capable of this kind of stuff. So, so looking at, um, that average association index for a random random pair of snakes that aren't making any choices or you know they don't really care who they're hanging out with. Um, an associate, again, that's just any amount, any snakes that were seen together at all. In order to be considered friends in our study, you had to have an association index that was at least twice what that random pair of snakes would do. And so that means there's a lot fewer of them. So on this, on this chart, again, going across the bottom, we have those different types of pairs, female juvenile, female female, female male, male male, male juvenile, and juvenile juvenile. Um, and then what the bars represent is the proportion of all of, for example, the male male pairs that were associates are in blue. And that is about 0.3, I think. <laughs> I should have labeled each one. And as you probably noticed, there were no male male friends. None of the pairs of males hung out enough together to meet that threshold of what we would call friends. Um, but we did see that with every other possible combination of animals um, and an especially high proportion in female female pairs. So this is an example of one of those female female pairs. This is Allie and Spooky. And they actually had an association index of one. We only ever saw these two together. And what's funny about this is, you know, if this was the only picture we had of these two snakes like that, they, you know, they're really close friends. They're together all the time. They're only ever together. Um, but like I said, we also did some camera work um, during the nesting season at the site. And we got the chance to see Spooky, Gestate, and Nest two different summers before and after this video was taken. And even though Spooky did go through her entire gestation one of those summers with a group of snakes, none of those snakes were Spooky. So apparently they're very good friends like outside of the den, but it is a different, a different pattern of who they associate with um, in different contexts. And, and that was, you know, we haven't looked at it um, statistically with a lot of the pairs of snakes because, you know, just numbers, there aren't a lot to look at it with the numbers, but, but that was true with some of the other females that we have observed nesting together during the summers or even 
with their offspring, when we saw them at the den, that doesn't necessarily make them friends um, in, this, in this context of hanging out at the den. So it's kind of interesting that they have different, um, you know, preferred affiliates in, in, different, in different places in different times. It actually is the same place, but at different, different times of the year for them. So kind of a different place. So around the time we were doing the study was actually when we started getting the idea of forming this nonprofit, Advocates for Snake Preservation or ASP. And one of the reasons is that when we started working with these cameras is that we realized that we were getting good data to study their social behavior, but also like getting this cool footage of snakes that you just don't get to see because they're not reacting to humans in these cases. They're just, you know, going about their daily business, which is really eye-opening to a lot of people who've never gotten to see snakes do anything that's not, um, you know, something scary or especially a defensive behavior. And so if you like this talk and you like these videos, um, on our website, we spend a lot of time um, using videos and pictures to tell stories, especially about these snake behaviors that people didn't know about, didn't, um, didn't really think to look for um, in snakes. Um, so the social behavior is one example, um, but parental care was another thing that had been kind of written off and, and is still honestly written off by a lot of people, even scientists for a long time, even though we've got some really good documentation now that this happens. Um, but you know, there's, there's a lot of other stuff to it too. And so, um, so yeah, you can find all of this and more on our website. And as well, I wanna put in a little plug, if you like this talk, um, we also host a monthly-ish online presentation series, live presentations with Q and A's. Um, not where I'm talking about our stuff every month, that would get boring real fast. Um, but we host just a variety of people who love snakes and have something interesting to say about snakes. And that's called Snakes Are Everything. And yeah, if you like this, I think you'll probably like that. And that is all I got so we can go. I have some like, I don't know what time it is. Um, I have some other like videos and stuff that are more just fun things, but I wanna give people a chance to ask questions first. <laughs> I have a question. Mm -hmm. uh, what is the advantage of them being together? That is a very good question. Um, so I should say that we did not get, you know, this was because it was all very new. We didn't actually get to study like potential advantages. So I'm just going to go off some things that are reasons that animals would like to be together. Um, so there are things, you know, they're pretty, you know, I think we think a lot of times of rattlesnakes as being very fierce and not having, you know, to worry about like predators because we're scared of them, but they do actually have a lot of predators. And especially in the early spring when they're still kind of like sluggish and waking up, um, they're pretty vulnerable this time of year. Um, I think that's why historically people have targeted rattlesnakes at dens to do various naughty things to them um, because they're an easy target at that point. So when you're hanging out in a group, there's this dilution effect, which means that my chance, my individual chance of getting taken by a predator is less because there's 10 other snakes right here that they could get. So that's one potential um, simple information or um, simple, simple explanation that, that could be happening. Um, there's also like a, a learning aspect to this. So what we started to see as we were studying these nests and we did the same thing where we were identifying the individual snakes. Um, so when the babies would show up at the den sites, um, you know, we would only ever see them at the den site where their mom denned as well. And so it could be that the groups formed that way, both as, you know, you end up with this group because they start coming there when they're babies and then they just keep coming there forever. But 
their mom is leaving a scent trail and so showing them the way to the den to make sure that they have and her genes have a safe place to spend the winter so they're more likely to survive than an, a newborn snake that's just left to his own devices of finding a place to 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 rest um, because it you know it seemed like and you know we knew there was at least for both of these sites another potential site that would work for them like pretty close and they didn't they didn't use them um, but there's still like some cost to especially like a first snake going to a new site like maybe it'll freeze maybe water will come in here maybe it's a big enough opening where a predator can come in the middle of the winter and get them um, so those are two reasons that seem real likely um, there could also be some reproductive stuff that even though we're not seeing any courtship or combat or anything obvious, um, it could be a way, you know, maybe some of the friendships and associations we were seeing were a way for them to check in with each other and see who was going to be available later that summer when it is their reproductive season. Um, and, you know, if they, they know and they seem to know in other places like where different, if the males seem to know where different females live in their territory. And so when they come out in the spring, if they can already tell if that female is gonna be available to mate or is this a year when she's giving birth, like then they know to travel over to her spot or not to travel over to her spot. So those are three potential reasons. Um, there's, there's probably other things that, that I'm not thinking of too, but that's a good question and not one that unfortunately we've been able to to tackle because it's it's a big it's a big complicated one melissa we also have a couple of questions um in the chat yeah let me yes. stop that and okay you are recording so you're going to put this up on your youtube right mm -hmm. Yeah, yeah, this is going to be on our YouTube channel. Uh, um, let's see. So how did I come to be fascinated by snakes? Um, I was really into dinosaurs when I was a little kid. Read every book at the library on dinosaurs. Um, and then it was all about alligators and crocodiles because they lived at the same time as dinosaurs and they still existed. And I saw this great movie when I was a kid where this girl went on vacation to Florida and she brought home a baby alligator and it ended up like getting flushed down the toilet and you know like killing everyone in New York or whatever but but that gave me the idea it's like oh I could like have a baby alligator well my parents did not let me do that um but not long after that we found or my dad found a garter snake in our backyard garden and and he let me hold her and they let me keep her for a while. And I just, I fell in love and, um, and I had, and she didn't, we ended up letting her go not long after that because she was a wild animal and didn't eat real well. But I had a pet snake that was um, from a pet store for 20 something years. <laughs> and um, yeah, even though I got interested in some other animals and some other things for a while, but um, as my road was leaving, leading me towards conservation, I kept coming back to snakes and eventually stuck with snakes because they're an underdog. Um, and it really seemed like even just in, in research, like they're kind of ignored for a lot of things. I mean, this is actually, the study was a good example. Like people, even people who are already studying snakes would not think to look at this stuff in them. And if you're interested in social behavior, 10, 15 years ago, you would have never thought to have a snake as your, you know, your model system or whatever, if you were just interested in that behavior and wanted to learn something new about it. Um, you know, and that's another reason besides just, I think, learning about the animals just for, just for that is cool enough. Um, but thinking if you're interested in like the evolution of social behavior and why we have, you know, ants with these crazy systems where they're almost functioning, you know, a large group as a single organism. And then you have other animals that, you know, only come into contact when they need to for sex, if there's, uh, if they reproduce sexually, 
Um, and there's clearly like there's steps and gradients in between. And so to ignore some of the more simple versions of that, which snakes are probably an example of is, is a mistake because you can learn a lot from that too. Um, yeah, and then I kind of already covered the snakes being the underdog as far as like people not liking them. Um, so that was what turned it around into forming this organization and doing this kind of work because um, yeah, they need, they need good PR. They get plenty of bad PR. <laughs> Okay, let's see. What is the largest snake I have seen in the wild? That's a good question. So I haven't spent enough time in the tropics to see any of the large constrictors or even gone down, like you don't actually have to go all the way like tropics, tropics. You can see boa constrictors in Sonora, Mexico. Um, but I haven't done that either. Um, so probably the largest, like the heaviest snake I've seen would have been a large Western diamondback. Um, now they don't, I, you know, people tell stories about six or seven footers. That's probably an exaggeration because generally they don't get to live that long anymore. Um, but there was one at this golf course where we worked that was, he was a solid five foot and like, well, I mean, you can't see me in port. I have kind of small arms, but he was as big around as like my wrist. And so relative to me, that seemed like a giant snake. Um, although I think there's a, a gopher snake that we also caught there that was probably longer because my um, six foot one inch um, boyfriend caught the snake and held it up and was over his head, but also still touching the ground. So that was a very, very large snake and like by my bicep size, an impressive, impressive animal for sure. Um, one of our board members, and actually the first talk we had on snakes for everything is about anacondas because he's the anaconda guy, the guy who's been studying them for a long time. So still hoping someday I will get to go see one of those because they're awesome. Um, how many young snakes does a female snake typically produce in a breeding season? Good question. Um, so I think the most often a snake will lay eggs or do or, or give birth to live young because different species, so there are some snake species that give birth to live young and there are some that lay eggs. I think the most often even in like the tropics they'll do that is, is once a year. Um, with rattlesnakes, it's every other year or even less often. Um, so with some of the snakes that have a really short active season, so like timber rattlesnakes that live in the northeastern U.S. that really only have three or four months when they can be outside of their den because it's just what a what a terrible cold place. Um, they they may give birth every three to five years, and so even though they can live a long time, like up to fifty years and plus, um, they may only give birth once or twice. Um, so when they have those litters, um, again, the snakes are a very diverse group. There's over 3,000 species. And some of those are like, you know, like earthworm size. I'm not even going to say nightcrawler because some of them are smaller than that. And then you have green anacondas, which can be almost 30 feet long and weigh 300 pounds. Um, so those really large snakes um, and anacondas are one, they're a boa. So they give birth to live young, and I think they can have like hundreds, like 200 or 300 babies um, because those females, the females in that species are the big ones. Those are the giant ones. And so they can hold a lot of babies. Um, they're probably not doing it every year though, <laughs> even though they live in the tropics. Um, for the Arizona black rattlesnakes and for most of the rattlesnakes in the Southwestern US, litter sizes are I mean, they can have only one or two babies, um, especially their, their first time around, that's pretty common. But I think the record is in the 20s. Um, although honestly, those are probably Texas snakes, not, not ones in Arizona. Um, typically what we'd see is like five. And I think most of the egg layers are pretty similar, except again, some of the tiny snakes we have like black-headed snakes um, and, um, Lion snakes, you know, they may have like just a couple eggs because they're just, they're so small. 
so small. Let's see, other questions. Um, so do the friends at the den during winter travel or spend the rest of the year? Um, so I'm not sure if you mean like, do they travel together? Like, like, do they leave after like during the summer or so we don't because we did this work using those cameras. One big limitation of this study is that we only know what they're doing when they're where the cameras are. Um, we weren't using radio telemetry here because um, the advantage of radio telemetry is you can, given your equipment doesn't fail, go find a snake anytime you want to. Um, the limitation of radio telemetry is that you can only do that with a very few animals because it's expensive. You can't do it with really small animals at all because in snakes, you have to surgically implant those radio transmitters. So you're really limited by size. So we know that's why we don't know that much about small snakes and baby snakes. Um, so once at this site, since we were just working with cameras, we could get information on a lot of snakes, but only when they were at places we put the cameras. So um, if they left and they weren't um, nesting at those same sites, we don't know what they did. <laughs> um, they could have been, I was gonna say holding hands and crawling around together, but they don't have hands, but um, they could have been hanging around together in other places. It's not something that we've come across in general when we're out looking for snakes. You just, you don't see them together that much during the active season. And I don't think that's necessarily like a, an antisocial thing as much as it's just practical. Um, and something that other animals that we think of as social also do. So snakes generally, and this is absolutely true of rattlesnakes, they swallow their food whole. So cooperative hunting and sharing of food is not really something that they can do. So it doesn't make a lot of sense for them during the time of year when they're eating to be hanging out together because that automatically means that only, you know, one of them is going to lose out, even if they're lucky enough to be near a food item. Um, and you see this with some other animals that we think of as being highly social and living in groups all the time. Like for instance, elephants often will forage by themselves. That's not true with their babies, but um, with the others, they'll group together during when they're not doing so much foraging, but then when they're foraging, they're off, they're off by themselves. And they have these fission fusion societies where they come together at certain times of the year and then certain times of the year they're they're not so social and that was actually when I was looking at um, different social systems <laughs> strangely elephants were one of the most similar ones that wasn't another um, that other than to rattlesnakes so I hope that answered the question <clears throat> um, Besides humans, what are other predators? Oh boy, yeah, that's a good question. Because again, I think we have in our head that like everyone is, is scared of them and they have a ton of predators. So birds of prey, hawks, eagles, owls, um, not vultures, because they don't, they don't eat livestock. They don't kill things. Um, and let's see. And actually, uh, a friend of mine that started doing some camera work at another rattlesnake den in Colorado, they have seen a lot of magpies eating baby rattlesnakes, which I knew that corvid sometimes attacked and killed things, but I was still like shocked to see that. But they have multiple videos of that happening. So it wasn't just like one weird time, like the magpies regularly show up at these communal rattlesnake nests because uh, it's like a buffet for them, I guess because <laughs> there's a ton of rattlesnakes there. Um, so certainly birds. Um, there's a lot of mammal predators too. So in our area, fox, badger, skunk, um, bobcats, coyotes, mountain lions. I'm probably leaving some off, but those, those are the big ones mammal wise. Um, and then also other reptiles. So they don't really have any lizard predators. Gila monsters eat eggs and baby birds and mammals. They don't really eat other reptiles. Um, other reptiles eat them. But there are several other snakes that will eat rattlesnakes. Rattlesnakes don't generally eat each other. Most of them, I mean, it happens, but for the most part, they don't really eat other snakes. Um, but 
whip snakes, coach whips, of course, king snakes are very famous for eating rattlesnakes. Um, and those are kind of the big three um, for snakes. I think that's most of the predators. I mean, I'm sure I'm forgetting somebody. <laughs> Oh, do the friends reunite year after year in winter when they're in the den? Good question. So I think this was clarifying the traveling thing. So um, we did this study with the cameras only two, two seasons. Um, so it would be really nice to have continued this forever and ever, but it um, even though the cameras were doing a lot of the work for us, it was it was still a lot to go out and batteries and switch out and just data storage for all of this. Um, so you're not so we haven't done like even the year to year comparisons, but because we only have the two, um, I'm not sure how much we would get from that just because it's um, but that's sort of whittling it down to nothing. Um, so yeah, so the short answer is I don't know. Um, and like I mentioned, I now um, one of our, our board members has started doing work with cameras at a prairie rattlesnake den in Colorado, the one that, where the magpies are eating baby rattlesnakes. Um, actually, they have a lot of other snake predators that show up there too. It seems like the animals know that's a good place to go for food, <laughs> um, which makes it very important to the ecosystem because it is a large concentration of, of food for a lot of different animals. Um, so I'm hoping that they might be able to get at some of these answers because they're in a little better place. And also because the technology has improved in the last 10 years um, that they might be able to get some of those kind of answers because they're probably gonna be doing similar analysis to what we did trying to look at friendships and associations between the animals at those dens too. So maybe we'll have an answer about that soon. Um, the females do tend to use the same nest sites every summer, and we would see the same females at the same nest. Like if they, if they were a, a social nester, they tended to stay that way and be back with a similar group of females um, two years later, although not always. And then you would see, or we saw a couple times, um, a young female when she was old enough to start breeding herself she would join her mother at the nest where she was born, which is pretty cool. So those bonds are, are long-term at those sites. They do tend to come back together. Um, let's see, do California king snakes or other snakes kill rattlesnakes? Yes and yes. Um, any, so I mentioned some of the species that are native to the Southwest, um, but indigo snakes, which are a very large snake that's found in the Eastern, Southeastern US, um, they eat a lot of rattlesnakes and copperheads too. So yeah, definitely other snakes. Um, all right, that is all the questions I see, unless I missed one. Awesome. Well, thank you. Um, I will definitely allow more time for questions, but I want to make sure that um, I plug a little bit of what Highland Center is planning on doing uh, in the future. So I'm going to share my screen real fast. So um, this is our website, Highland Center for Natural History. Uh, and if you're ever interested in any adult programs, this is where you're going to find our Zoom programs. Our one for August is a um, hydroclimatologist and from ASU, Dr. Crimmins. I'll show you that. So that is August 24th from 7 to 8, uh, and you can register for that. We also have a lot of in-person programs happening. We have a way to subscribe to our newsletter. Um, but we also have life enrichment through nature. So this course was designed with seniors in mind and it's taught by Tom Benson, who's one of our naturalists and he's been a naturalist for over 27 years. So this is a six week course to give you a little bit more um, information about um, ways to enrich your life as well as um, things, um, sorry, I lost my track, uh, natural history and um, geology, wildlife, edible plants, things like that. We also have our summer colored pencil drawing series coming up. 
and our Highland Center Book Club, which is also a free in-person program. Um, I also want to draw attention to Grow Native Plant Sale is going to be happening soon and Hiking Spree is coming up as well. And of course, if you're interested in family programs or youth programs, I recommend looking at our education programs there. Uh, I also have advocates um, for snake preservation bookmarked. So I will show you guys the website um, that Melissa was uh, talking about. This is her nonprofit organization. So thank you. Awesome, thanks. And Melissa, there's another question if you have time to answer it. Yeah, sure. So this is a good one. What are the benefits to having snakes in your yard? Um, so I'm gonna answer this in a couple different ways because um, you know, we at ASP really focus on, you know, and not just for snakes, but when I have the opportunity to talk about other animals, like liking them for them. And, and I think that, um, and this is especially true of rattlesnakes like you can get you can get to see really cool stuff so that um that video that i showed towards the beginning of courtship with the rock rattlesnakes that was in my backyard and that was day seven that those snakes were in our yard um and so if on day one if we did what a lot of people do and i understand the reasons for doing this um you know had taken the shovel to them or Put them in a bucket and carted them way far away like we would have we would have never gotten that courtship and obviously my partner and i are not going to do that because we're us but um but you you have the opportunity to see a lot of neat things and and honestly like you have a better opportunity of seeing them when you have resident snakes in your yard than when you're a scientist that's going out and studying them i have with the exception of the the camera work where we were at a site where we already new stuff was happening to put up cameras. My coolest observations of snake behavior have been when either in my, my current place where we live with the snakes because we're out in the woods um, or when I lived on a nature preserve in Southern Arizona and same thing, I had them, I had them in my backyard. Um, you know, we got to know the snakes and where they were gonna hang out. And in some respects, I think they got to know the people that lived there and where we were likely to step and stuff. And so we could all move safely throughout the environment. And so you get to see really, really interesting things that a lot of people don't get to. And I mean, and honestly, like discoveries, things that people have just never seen before at all. Um, so there's that. And so that's one reason, but I think a lot of times this question is coming from thinking about ecosystem services type things. So that kind of benefit that snakes can have. And snakes are an awesome organic natural pest control for animals that, you know, I, I love all wildlife and I try my best to coexist with them, but man, I wish I had more black-tailed rattlesnakes in my yard so that there were fewer pack rats and more bean plants in my garden because, man, they're just really doing a number on that. Um, and we're lucky because for whatever reason, they haven't touched the wiring in our car, which is a pretty common problem in the Southwest <laughs> with rodents. And snakes can really help you take care of that. So while they have slow metabolisms and they're not eating super frequently, which I think makes people think, um, and I thought I would have thought this too, honestly, before this study came out that I'm about to mention that, you know, they they're they're not as good as having like a hawk or a fox around or something. But because snakes are so tolerant of each other and in some cases social, they're not territorial, although the males will fight over females, they don't like drive each other out of land or defend any other sort of resource. For, for the most part, there's a couple really cool exceptions to this, but not around here. Um, because of that, that overlapping and that snakes have a greater ability to um, live through a drought or other bad times, um, whereas mammals and birds that need to eat more frequently can't do that. And mammals and bird predators are general, like generally territorial and they'll drive each other away. So snakes have a much greater impact on their prey, on keeping those 
animals in check than any other type of predator that they exist with, um, which is really cool. I mean, like I said, I was kind of surprised because I just thought given that they may only eat once a month that that could possibly add up to you know, a red-tailed hawk that has to take out that amount of food every week or every few days, but, um, but all those other factors help. Um, and they're not just eating rodents. Um, small snakes will eat insects. Of course, some of them eat lizards, which is unfortunate for the pest control thing in the garden because lizards are super awesome garden helpers because they are insectivores. All of them that we have in the US are primarily insectivores. Um, so yeah, I mean, those are their big benefits besides just being, being cool and interesting. And if you don't want venomous snakes in your yard, um, then you should be excited about some of the other snakes, especially if they're king snakes, those would be the best choice. It doesn't mean that no other snake is going to show up. Um, wildlife don't really have the privilege of completely avoiding their predators. Sometimes they need to do what they need to do. Um, but they can certainly help. And because snakes aren't just predators, remember I mentioned before about all the predators that they have, having a healthy population of snakes around means that you're gonna attract some of their predators too, which are also animals that you might enjoy seeing and, and feeding um, like hawks, like owls, like bobcats. Well, thank you all so much for coming. And I'm seeing, I'm just not reading aloud all the, the compliments on the pictures and the videos and stuff. I appreciate that. We, um, yeah, we try to make them beautiful and appealing and interesting. And luckily we don't have to try very hard because they're excellent models. <laughs> Awesome. Yeah, that was great. And um, obviously I had uh, Advocates for Snakes um, bookmarks because I saw your article like over a year ago and like someone published you and I was like, oh, we got to have her for a presentation someday. That'd be awesome. That's why you're bookmarked. So thank you so much for doing this. Um, and I'm really excited to put this on YouTube as well. So thank you all for coming um, and making this such a huge program. So thanks. Yeah, thank you, everybody. Thanks for having me. Yeah. Awesome. Thanks for staying up late with us, Melissa. <laughs> Sweet.